Kais Comic Wernicke. Summary This tapestry, sponsored slash created by Kais Kama Trust, is based on Picasso's painting that depicts the bombing of Guernica, Spain during the Spanish Civil War. However the theme this time is HIV slash AIDS. Artwork Basic details about the artwork. Medium, textile. Dimensions, 7.8 mx 3.5 m. Painted in 2010. Primarily designed by Carol Hoffmeyer, a doctor. Creator. Sponsored by the Kaiskama Trust, based in South Africa. A charity program, it aims to build healthy communities in all respects via art, health, education, and music. The artists were predominantly women, a team effort yay. Inspiration. Based on Picasso's Guernica. Depicts the bombing of the Basque town Guernica, northern Spain. The bombing of Guernica happened during the Spanish Civil War, 1936 to 1939. At that time Guernica was used as a communication center by the Republicans the ones who were overthrown by the nationalists led by Francisco Franco, those who were in last year's syllabus should prop remember him. On April 26, 1937, Francisco gave the green light for the Luftwaffe and the Italian Air Force to bomb the city. The raid was originally intended to target key bridges and roads. However, at that time precision bombing was still being developed, so instead the bombs killed more than a thousand as the town was engulfed with flames. Historians argued whether this was accidental or a legitimate terror attack against a defenseless open city. Seen by some as a war crime, it was one of the aerial bombings to capture global attention, and had alerted the world about Germany's brutality, showing that not even civil lanes are safe in a war. Interpretations and details. So first off instead of depicting war it depicts HIV slash AIDS. You probably know why they chose this to be their main theme for this tapestry. For example, on the left you can see a Kosa woman, the native people of South Africa, holding a child on his lap. His ribs are sticking out, which is a sign of HIV slash AIDS. Interestingly instead of horses in Picasso's painting, this tapestry instead uses cattle, which is far more meaningful in their culture. Differences between this and Picasso's artwork. On first glance it looks like a direct ripoff, tbh in my opinion, the copying is a bit too much, but closer depiction reveals some thorough slash thoughtful differences. For example, the horses now turn to cattle. And there are a lot more people, especially on the right side, with some looking dead, probably from HIV slash AIDS. Moreover, this time there are more colorful birds, which can be interpreted as hope that HIV slash AIDS will one day be eradicated from South Africa. And also along the bottom there are brooches, each one of them is in memory of a family member who died from HIV slash AIDS. I can list like a million differences, but we would be here all day, this is just to give a rough idea about the differences between them. Opinions For me, I am not really a fan of this messy approach to these themes, but I do understand the usefulness of this approach. Would I say that this is superior to Picasso's painting? For me, no. Picasso's artwork is much simpler and it more easily conveys the horrors to me. People making art by a household objects. Summary Inspired by the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, Getty decided to ask the community to recreate their favorite artwork with household objects during the pandemic. Question slash link. Professional artists aren't the only ones who remake famous artworks. In the early months of the pandemic, long before the sourdough grew stale, the Getty Museum, LA, California, challenged everyday people to attempt it with household objects. Challenge. Started in March 25th. 2020. Inspired from Rijks Museum in Amsterdam who found an Instagram account called Between Art and Quarantine, which had three criteria to join. Choose an artwork. Use three household items to recreate the artwork. Tag the account. In Getty's case, 
they issued the challenge on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, and used the hashtags hashtag between our tent quarantine and hashtag tussenkinstent quarantine. Results slash examples. Aftermath. They received so many submissions that they were able to create a book titled Off the Walls, inspired recreations of iconic artworks and was published in July. The profits of the sales were donated to Artist Relief, a charity that supports artists with financial difficulties during the pandemic. Opinions In my opinion, this is a good way to study state people's boredom during the pandemic and actually bring the community together. Though personally I am not really interested in doing this activity. Questions Which one of these hashtags would you use to share your household art? Hashtag household art in quarantine. Hashtag get I museum challenge. Hashtag between our tent quarantine. Hashtag make and garden quarantine. Hashtag artist funing carotene. ANSC. Untitled, Guernica redacted, Robert Longo. Summary. This painting made by New Yorker Robert Longo is basically just him using charcoal to paint a copy of Picasso's Guernica, only this time he adds six vertical black stripes in order to redact the image. Nice. Artwork, painter. Basic details about artwork. Medium, charcoal on mounted paper. Dimension 283.2 x 620.4 cm. Painted in 2014. Painter. Born in 1953, age 69 to 70, in NYC. He's an artist, filmmaker, photographer, and musician. Became well known for his Men in the City's drawing, which depicts several businessmen in contoured shapes. His realistic drawings mostly consist of black and white images, with some of them being based from photos. He also likes to use charcoal to draw for some reason, since charcoal drawing takes a lot of effort, and that effort is important to him. Quote drawing from photos is a way of reclaiming the images that haunt us. By drawing them, I make them become not just something I am looking at but something that becomes part of me. He was also interested in drawing stuff that depicts power and violence, probably as a result of his friend being killed in a student protest in Ohio. Inspiration Based on Picasso's Guernica Depicts the bombing of the Basque town Guernica, northern Spain. The bombing of Guernica happened during the Spanish Civil War, 1936 to 1939. At that time Guernica was used as a communication center by the Republicans the ones who were overthrown by the nationalists led by Francisco Franco, those who were in last year's syllabus should prop remember him. On April 26, 1937, Francisco gave the green light for the Luftwaffe and the Italian Air Force to bomb the city. The raid was originally intended to target key bridges and roads. However, at that time precision bombing was still being developed, so instead the bombs killed more than a thousand as the town was engulfed with flames. Historians argued whether this was accidental or a legitimate terror attack against a defenseless open city. Seen by some as a war crime, it was one of the aerial bombings to capture global attention, and had alerted the world about Germany's brutality, showing that not even civil lanes are safe in a war. Interpretations and Details The first thing to note is that there are six black vertical strips that cover like half of the image. Since the black and white film slash photographs of wartime events was what probably influenced Picasso, Longo wanted the stripes to to remind us of the frames of old-fashioned films and the flicker of the newsreels of the past, or the redaction of sensitive information plus the bars of a prison. This adds more suspense, that maybe it was too gruesome for an ordinary viewer had to see and so some parts of it was redacted. It's basically the same thing just with stripes lol. Opinion I think Longo's perspective of Guernica is alright, though I think he should add more stuff in rather than just oh let me just add some stripes and call it a day. I also like the title of the drawing for some reason. Fun fact, while it was exhibiting in Ohio, a security guard shot this painting twice, and then shot himself in front of it.
questions. What did Robert Longo add slash change in his version of Guernica? Vertical black stripes. Horizontal black stripes. Changing the theme to HIV slash AIDS. Making it colorful. Nothing. ANS. Diorama. Summary. A diorama is a three-dimensional replica of a scene. They vary in sizes, most often miniature or large-scaled, depicting historical events or scenes in nature. Dioramas were invented by Louis Daguerre and Charles Marie Bowden in 1822, Paris. Daguerre's dioramas are different from modern dioramas, early dioramas by Daguerre were a large painting painted on both sides of a translucent material. The painting would change in appearance through different angles of illumination, when illuminated from the front, the scene would be shown in one state and so forth. The modern diorama was popularized by habitat dioramas, which were invented by Carl Akeley. Habitat dioramas are made using taxidermy and a painted background on a curved wall. These dioramas were born out of Akeley and Theodore Roosevelt's goals of conservation, and to preserve nature as environments change due to human involvement. What is a diorama? 3D replica slash model of IRL scene, historical events, natural environments. Made by placing objects, figures, etc. in front of painted BG. Often miniature or large scale. Who invented it? Louis Jacques Monde Daguerre and Charles Marie Bowden in 1822, Paris. Daguerre also invented first widely used photography method, daguerreotype. Early dioramas by Daguerre. Big painting painted on both sides of a translucent material. How they worked. PPL sit in a dark, rotating auditorium with the diorama. Painting's appearance changes through illumination. I.e. When shine light from front, scene A is shown, when shine light from the back, scene B is shown. Example, daylight rightward arrow moonlight. Seamless transition of scene to scene made dioramas look be realistic. Habitat dioramas. Popularized modern dioramas in early 1900s. Who created them? Carl Akeley in 1890. His first diorama, Five Muskrats in a Set that Contained a Den, reads, Logs and Sediment and Realistic BG. How they were made. 3D scene using taxidermy and painted background on curved wall, to surround the display without seams joining different panels. Taxidermy equals stuffing and mounting an animal's body for display slash study. Led to Akeley method of taxidermy. Precise measurements, making plaster impressions, fitting skin over lifelike clay sculptures made from skeleton bones. Go to far locations to recreate them and collect specimens. Got to know their subjects and surroundings intimately. How they are made now. Same as how they were made but with more advanced tech. Extensive research to provide verisimilitude, realistic. Use satellite imagery and videos. Read books and journal articles. Consult scientists, botanists, zoologists, anthropologists, archaeologists. Takes months to build a habitat diorama. Their purpose. Promote conservation. Theodore Roosevelt and Akeley believe they'd make PPL want to protect environment. Imitate nature. Preserve nature as environments change due to human activity. Educate museum goers about animals they will likely never see IRL. Conveys complex culture without words. Make it feel like a real encounter with nature. Hatch Elbel and Canon in D. Introduction. Canon in D is a famous Baroque music popular even in the modern day, with its tune used in many different instruments. It was composed by Johann Patch Elbel, a German composer and organist. His songs went out of style, until centuries later would become extremely popular again, often incorporated within other artists' musical works or TV soundtracks. This was because of its simple, emotion-evoking, and elegant nature. The type of technique used by this music is called canon, 
where a melody is repeated, echoed, or sounded in unison again, may it be softer or slightly distorted. Johann Patch Elbel Born, Free Imperial City of Nuremberg Role, one of the most imp composers, Middle Baroque era Career, German composer, organist, and teacher Personal life Born in middle class family Had many teachers and went to schools Very popular in his life Had many pupils Music influenced by Southern German composers. Famous for writing organ music and canon in D. Side note, what is canon music? Principle of strict imitation. Initial melody is imitated again. With specified time intervals by one or more parts. Can be in unison or on dip pitch. Oldest known canon. 13th century English round Sumer is Icumen in. Also called, Reading Rota. Example picture that melody repeated three times, overlapping. Canon in D slash Pachel Bell's Canon. Introduction. Johann Patch Elbel, Canon in D major, PLS admire his face. An accompanied canon by Patch Elbel. Supposedly for three violins plus basso continuo plus jake. In the key of D major. DK its date nor the circumstances of its composition, within 1680 to 1706. Oldest surviving manuscript copy, dates from 1838 to 1842. History. Like his other works, went out of style. Remained in obscurity for centuries. 1968, recording of it by the Jean-Francois Paillard Chamber Orchestra gained popularity. Done in a more romantic way. 1970s, piece began to be recorded by many ensembles. Early 1980s, presence as background music everywhere. 1970s, elements of the piece, especially its chord progression, used in a variety of pop songs. 1980s, Common use in weddings and funeral ceremonies, Western. Reworks. Music examples using it. Memories Maroon 2019. Soviet National Anthem, Ikr. All Together Now The Farm 1991. Rain and Tears Aphrodite's Child. Oh Lord, Why Lord Pop Tops. Example by WSC. Graduation. Friends Forever Vitamin C About how many friends drift apart soon after graduation from high school Released in March 2000 Popular in many Western countries Influence on music Make canon popular Many songs utilize it Transcribed to many other types of instruments Acoustic, electronic, etc. Maybe even sound effects television tracks popular among many artists used by everyone everywhere weddings romance bg music why popular extremely attractive sound recognizable baroque elegant and charming very simple to play repeating melody people have become familiar with it attaching emotions to it Many have limited knowledge of classical music. Hence when playing stuff would naturally choose the simple one. WSC questions. Why do we keep going back to certain pieces in this way? Fine let me ans WSC's question. Prob because many artists grew up learning and exposed to classical music. Hence would adapt this into their music. Very simple yet catchy, inspire many artists become a building block for music growth. Controversy, though some believe it is stemming creativity. Popularization, use too much. Remove the canon from the canon, my assumption. First canon, the imitative canon style from the musical scene as well as the popularization of canon in D everywhere. Second canon, music of highest quality in which people like it, use it, and enforce it. Basically, 
removing this popularization of canon in D in music, thinking it is stemming music creativity. Question. What is the oldest known music utilizing the musical canon? Frere Jacques. Sumer is Ikumen in. Tosto Che El Alba. Row, row, row your boat. Spring, Vivaldi. Opera. A little summary. Opera is a form of theatrical art that combines music, drama, and dance. The first opera, Daphne, was composed by Jacopo Perry in 1597 with a libretto written by Ottavio Rinaccini. It was performed as part of a wedding celebration for the Grand Duke of Tuscany and based on a Greek mythology story. The success of Daphne led to the creation of other operas, and opera quickly became a popular form of entertainment throughout Italy and Europe. The difference between opera and Broadway-style musical theater are their performance conditions and musical styles. Due to modern changes, opera has been slowly declining. Introduction Opera is a form of theater that combines music, drama, and dance. Originated in Italy during the 16th century and quickly spread throughout Europe, becoming a popular form of entertainment for both the upper and lower classes. Since then, opera has evolved and become an integral part of many cultures around the world. The Origins of Opera The Italian word opera means work, both in the sense of the labor done and the result produced. The Italian word derives from the Latin word opera, a singular noun meaning work and also the plural of the noun opus. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, the Italian word was first used in the sense composition in which poetry, dance, and music are combined in 1639. The first recorded English usage in this sense dates to 1648. Opera was born during the Renaissance period in Italy, where a group of artists, musicians, and scholars gathered together in Florence in the late 16th century. They aimed to create a new form of theatrical art that combined music and drama, inspired by the classical works of ancient Greece and Rome. The first opera, Daphne, was performed in Florence in 1597, and it quickly gained popularity throughout Europe. The first ever opera, the first opera to be performed was Daphne by Jacopo Perry in 1597. It was composed by Jacopo Perry in 1598 and the libretto was written by Ottavio Rinaccini. It was based on a story from Greek mythology, and was performed as part of a wedding celebration for the Grand Duke of Tuscany. The success of Daphne led to the creation of other operas, and opera quickly became a popular form of entertainment throughout Italy and Europe. What makes opera different than Broadway-style musical theater? Performance Traditions Traditionally, opera is performed in grand opera houses with elaborate costumes, sets, and lighting. The focus is on the music and vocal performances, with less emphasis on dancing or physical movement. In contrast, Broadway-style musicals are often performed in smaller theaters or outdoor venues with simpler sets and lighting. There is more emphasis on choreography and physical movement, and performers wear contemporary costumes. Musical Styles Opera music is typically performed by highly trained singers in a classical style, accompanied by a full orchestra. The music is complex and requires extensive vocal range and control. In contrast, Broadway-style musical theater features songs with similar melodies and rhythms that are easier to sing. The music is often performed by a smaller ensemble, such as a band or piano. The cost of a double espresso. The minister made the announcement after meeting with La Scala Superintendent Alexander Pereira about making sure the new generations learn more about opera. Young people between 18 and 25 will be able to go to La Scala for two euros starting with the next season at the iconic Milanese Opera House. The plan has been proposed to Italy's other 14 opera foundations and they have all accepted. Is it possible to reimagine opera in ways so immersive that they aren't really opera anymore? If so, what is opera becoming? Yes. Opera has been reimagining the traditional form of opera to attract new and younger audiences. 
they incorporate elements of popular culture, technology, and experimental staging into their productions, which depart from traditional operatic forms and become something else entirely. Some modern changes to opera include the use of new technologies, experimental staging, and incorporating elements of popular culture. Due to modern changes, opera has been slowly declining. Opera has faced challenges in recent years, including declining audience numbers and financial difficulties for some opera companies. This is partly due to changing cultural and entertainment preferences, as well as the high costs associated with producing and staging operas. Back to the Future Directed by Robert Zemeckis Written by Robert Zemeckis, Bob Gale Produced by Bob Gale, Neil Canton Starring Michael J. Fox, Christopher Lloyd, Lee Thompson, Crispin Glover Cinematography Dean Conde Edited by Arthur Schmidt, Harry Karamidas Music by Alan Silvestri Production company Amblin Entertainment Distributed by Universal Pictures Release date July 3, 1985 Running time 116 minutes Country United States Language English Budget $19 million Box office $388.8 million Summary Back to the Future is a science fiction film directed by Robert Zemeckis and written by Zemeckis and Bob Gale. It explores the themes of time travel, family relationships, and the consequences of changing the past. The film uses the concept of a time machine, which allows the main character Marty to travel back in time to the 1950s. The consequences of changing the past are explored, highlighting the idea that some things cannot be changed. The use of period-specific music in movies set in the past is a powerful tool to evoke nostalgia and create a more immersive experience for viewers. In Back to the Future, the use of Mr. Sandman by the Cordettes helps to establish the 1950s setting and create a sense of nostalgia for viewers. Introduction Back to the Future is a science fiction film released in 1985, directed by Robert Zemeckis and written by Zemeckis and Bob Gale. The film follows the story of teenager Marty McFly, who accidentally travels back in time to the 1950s in a time machine created by his eccentric friend, Dr. Emmett Brown. The film explores the themes of time travel, family relationships, and the consequences of changing the past. Background the idea for Back to the Future came to Bob Gale when he was visiting his parents' home and found his father's high school yearbook. Gale wondered if he would have been friends with his father if they had gone to school together, and this led to the idea of a time travel story. Gale approached Robert Zemeckis, and the two began working on the script. The film was made by Universal Pictures and was a box office success, grossing over $381 million worldwide. It was also critically acclaimed, receiving positive reviews from critics and audiences alike. The film was nominated for four Academy Awards, winning one for Best Sound Editing. Time Travel One of the central themes of Back to the Future is time travel, and the film explores various aspects of this concept. The film uses the concept of a time machine, which allows Marty to travel back in time to the 1950s. The time machine is a DeLorean sports car modified by Dr. Brown to travel through time when it reaches 88 miles per hour. The film presents a version of time travel in which the past can be changed, leading to different outcomes in the present. Marty accidentally changes his parents' meeting in the past, which creates a new timeline where his parents do not get together. Marty must then try to fix the timeline by getting his parents back together before it's too late. Consequences of Changing the Past Back to the Future also examines the consequences of changing the past. Marty's actions in the past have unintended consequences in the present, and he must work to fix the timeline to prevent disastrous outcomes. For example, when Marty returns to the present, he finds that his actions have created a dystopian timeline where his family is dysfunctional and his hometown is a haven for criminals. 
The film also highlights the idea that some things cannot be changed, no matter how much we may want them to be. Marty realizes that he cannot prevent his friend, Dr. Brown, from being killed in the future, and he must come to terms with this fact. How much does it matter that movies set in the past use music from that same period? The use of period-specific music in movies set in the past can be a powerful tool to evoke nostalgia and transport viewers to a different time and place. When a filmmaker chooses a song from a particular era, they are not just selecting a piece of music that was popular at the time. They are also choosing a song that represents the cultural and social context of that era. Moreover, music is an essential element of filmmaking, and it can be used to enhance the emotional impact of a scene or to underscore the mood of a particular moment. Using music from the same period as the setting of a film can help to create a more immersive experience for viewers, making them feel as though they are really there in that time and place. In the case of Back to the Future, the use of Mr. Sandman by the Cordettes helps to establish the 1950s setting and create a sense of nostalgia for viewers who grew up during that time. The song's catchy melody and lyrics conjure up images of sock hops, soda fountains, and teenage romance, all of which are key elements of the film's setting. Gao Xiao Song Yu Who Sat Next To Me Gao Xiao Song, a Chinese musician, songwriter, producer, and filmmaker, and his famous song You Who Sat Next To Me. The article explores the background and inspiration of the song, its lyrics and meaning, and its impact on Chinese music and culture. The article concludes by highlighting Gao Xiaosong's significant contributions to the Chinese music industry and his influence on generations of Chinese artists and musicians. Introduction Gao Xiaosong is a Chinese musician, songwriter, producer, and filmmaker who is well known for his contributions to the Chinese music and entertainment industry. He was born on February 1, 1969, in Nanjing, China. He started his career in the music industry as a songwriter and went on to become one of the most influential figures in the Chinese music scene. In 2009, Gao Xiaosong was appointed as the honorary president of Beijing Contemporary Music Academy. In 2015, he founded a non-profit organization called Zishugwin Library, where he currently serves as the curator. The library has a vast collection of over 800,000 books and documents, primarily published during the Ming and Qing dynasties and the Republic of China period. Gao Xiaosong is a pro-democracy activist in mainland China who has been spreading the idea of American democracy and Western culture to a wide Chinese audience through online video platforms. He is a vocal critic of the Chinese Communist Party's official historical narrative, political system, and ideology. In September 2021, his works were banned by Chinese authorities. One of Gao Xiaosong's most famous works is the song You Who Sat Next To Me, which he wrote in 1995. The song became an instant hit in China and has since become a classic. Background and Inspiration Gao Xiaosong wrote You Who Sat Next To Me in 1995, during a time when he was experiencing personal turmoil in his life. He had just gone through a painful divorce and was dealing with the aftermath of the Tiananmen Square protests, which had occurred six years earlier. The song was inspired by Gao Xiaosong's experiences of feeling isolated and disconnected from the world around him. He wrote the song as a reflection on the fleeting nature of relationships and the importance of cherishing the moments we share with others. Lyrics and Meaning The lyrics of You Who Sat Next To Me are simple yet poignant. The song is sung from the perspective of someone who is reminiscing about a brief encounter with a stranger. The narrator reflects on the shared moment of sitting next to each other and wonders what the stranger's life is like now. The chorus of the song is particularly powerful, with the lyrics you who sat next to me, where are you now? What are you doing? Are you still as carefree as you were then? These lines capture the essence of the song, which is about the fleeting nature of connections and the importance of cherishing the moments we share with others. Impact on Chinese Music and Culture You Who Sat Next To Me has had a profound impact on Chinese music and culture. 
The song became an instant hit in China and has since become a classic. It has been covered by numerous artists and has been used in films, TV shows, and advertisements. The song's popularity can be attributed to its universal themes of love, loss, and nostalgia. The song resonates with people from all walks of life and has become an anthem for those who have experienced loss or felt disconnected from the world around them. Gao Ziyasong's contributions to the Chinese music industry extend beyond you who sat next to me. He has produced and written numerous songs for some of China's most famous artists, including Fei Wang and N.A. Ying. He has also produced films and television shows, including the hit Chinese reality show Superboy. The Beatles Yesterday A little summary Yesterday is a popular song written by Paul McCartney and performed by The Beatles. McCartney came up with the melody in a dream and wrote the lyrics, originally titled Scrambled Eggs, in 1964. The song was released as a single in the United States in 1965, where it reached number one on the Billboard Hot 100 chart. Yesterday has had a significant impact on popular culture, with over 2,200 cover versions recorded and its use in numerous films, television shows, and commercials. It is widely regarded as one of the greatest songs ever written and has won several awards. The song is a reflection on lost love and the memories that remain, and its timeless melody and universal themes have resonated with audiences of all ages and backgrounds. Yesterday all my troubles seemed so far away. Now it looks as though they're here to stay. Oh, I believe in yesterday. Suddenly, I'm not half the man I used to be. There's a shadow hanging over me. Oh, yesterday came suddenly. Why she had to go? I don't know, she wouldn't say. I said something wrong. Now I long for yesterday. Yesterday love was such an easy game to play. Now I need a place to hide away. Oh, I believe in yesterday. Why she had to go? I don't know, she wouldn't say. I said something wrong. Now I long for yesterday. Yesterday love was such an easy game to play. Now I need a place to hide away. Oh, I believe in yesterday. MMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMM
who remain one of the most beloved and influential bands in the history of modern music. The meaning of the song Yesterday is a song about a man who said something stupid to his girlfriend, causing her to leave him. He feels sad and regrets taking their relationship for granted. Its simplicity and emotional depth have made it a timeless classic, resonating with listeners of all ages and backgrounds. He longs for the past and doesn't seem to have the emotional strength to make amends. The song is a reflection on the pain of lost love and the memories that remain. The song suggests that he may not have learned from his mistake, and he repeatedly expresses his longing for yesterday. Legacy Yesterday is widely regarded as one of the greatest songs ever written, and its legacy continues to this day. It is one of the most covered songs in history, with over 1,600 versions recorded by 1986 and about 500 included in Muzak's inventory. It is also credited with popularizing classical and Baroque rock, influencing artists such as the Rolling Stones and the Moody Blues. In 1997, the song was inducted into the Grammy Hall of Fame, and in 2000, it was named the Song of the Century by the Recording Industry Association of America and the National Endowment for the Arts. The song has also been included on numerous greatest songs lists, including Rolling Stone's 500 Greatest Songs of All Time list. Yesterday won the Ivor Novello Award in 1965 and has been highly ranked on several greatest songs lists, including Rolling Stone's 500 Greatest Songs of All Time and the Beatles' own list. It was also recognized as one of the most performed songs of the 20th century on American radio and television. In a 1999 BBC Radio 2 poll, Yesterday was voted the best song of the 20th century.